guys welcome back to my channel I'm Christy I hope y'all are doing well it is cold here in Oklahoma and I'm not enjoying that we got a freeze before my son in Massachusetts which is very unusual a um, few things to kind of get out of the way real quick I did a live this morning with my friend Brooks on crime lines and lies she is another Oklahoma girl so you can go over there and catch that on the replay it was about a uh, little Quentin Simon uh, I think I joined it was about an hour in and I was on till the end and I had put up a community post that we were going to go to Oak Muggy and cover the murders of the four missing bicyclists that were found murdered. After digging in a little deeper and getting quite a few messages cautioning me about going, I decided for safety reasons we are not going to go and do a video live from Oak Muggy. I will cover the case, obviously, because it's national news and it is right down the road from me. But if you saw my members only video, the group we discussed in that has been brought up in this case as well. And I was already cautioned about my safety as far as that video went. So I'm not going to risk my safety or my family's safety over a story so I will cover it I just can't put myself in the position of going there in person right now so that brings us to today we are coming up on Halloween you can see my spooky-ish background and I thought to kind of take a break from all of these crazy cases that are going on, I would tell you a spooky story. Now, what really makes this spooky and scary is it's true. It actually happened. Uh, it does sound like a horror movie. But the good news is at the end of this horror movie, the monster will not be coming back. So you can wait for that. It's been referred to as the nightmare in Napa. It happened, technically, it was the wee hours of November 1st, but Halloween night of 2004. So let's go ahead and dive into our story. I hope you enjoy it. I put a lot of work into it. It's a very interesting case. So, as I said, today's story takes us to Napa. This is their welcome sign. Napa, California is known for its temperate weather, gorgeous scenery, local vineyards, and being a very safe community. Despite the many tourists who come from other parts of California, as well as throughout the rest of the United States and the world, crime was not a common occurrence. In fact, Napa had not had a homicide in over two years as Halloween of 2004 rolled around. On that Halloween night, the tranquility of Napa was shattered when an intruder slipped into a home, brutally stabbed two 26-year-old roommates to death, and vanished into the night. There was a third roommate who was left alive. She heard the attack saw the aftermath, and lived in terror for months afterwards. She recalled it as being like a horror movie. These are the two roommates that did not survive. Adrian and Leslie. Both 26 years old had their whole lives ahead of them, just smart, beautiful, amazing young women. And this is the house they shared in Napa. 
With nothing resembling a nightlife, Napa was an unlikely choice for three single, attractive, career-oriented women in their 20s. But that was where Lauren Mianza, an all-star athlete with a political science degree, and Adrian Insagna, a civil engineer with the city sanitation district, chose to begin their careers. They got along so well that in early 2004, they decided to rent a house together on the west side of town on Dorset Street. On the day they moved in, Adrian's friend, Ben Katz, helped out, and her other friends, Lily Prudholm and Eric Koppel, joined them for an impromptu housewarming celebration. Here's a picture of Lily and Adrian. They were pretty much best friends. Later in the summer, Leslie Mazzara, a bubbly former beauty queen from South Carolina who worked as a public relations specialist, became their third roommate. The girls got along well and enjoyed sharing the house. They loved always having someone to talk to about their days while still having their own rooms for private quiet time when they needed it. The only ripple in this otherwise harmonious situation happened on October 28th. Leslie brought home a boyfriend in the middle of the night and apparently kept her roommates up with the sounds of them, you know, being intimate. He was the first member of the opposite sex any of them had brought home for the night. After some discussion, they eventually agreed it would be okay. On Halloween... The three roommates stayed home and handed out candy to trick-or-treaters. By 11 p.m., the lights were out and all three had turned in. Adrian and Leslie to their upstairs bedrooms and Lauren to her downstairs bedroom. All was quiet until around 2 a.m. This is their house in the evening, but that night it would have been completely dark. Between 1.30 and 2 a.m., a security light tripped on behind the garage, causing Lauren's dog to give a warning bark. Lauren dismissed the security light going on as probably being one of Adrian's cats. She quieted her dog and began to drift back to sleep. Within minutes... Lauren heard someone entering the house and going upstairs. She thought it might be Leslie's boyfriend from three nights before, and she thought, oh no, not again. But not wanting to be a spoil sport, she stayed quietly in her room. She quieted her dog and again drifted off to sleep. She was awoken by a terrifying commotion. She heard breaking glass and what she described as a blood-curdling, terrified scream. Adrian kept screaming, oh my God, please help, please help. In total darkness, Lauren cautiously crept from her bed. She opened her door and took one step out. But then she was overcome with fear. She stood in the dark, frozen, listening until she heard the sound of heavy footsteps coming down the stairs towards her. The intruder ran down the stairs, breaking stuff as he went. In her panic, Lauren ran, but she ran the wrong way. She ran out the back door into the yard, surrounded by a six-foot fence and no way to get out. Lauren hid and remained perfectly still. She heard the intruder struggling with the kitchen blinds in the front of the house. Eventually, she would hear the sound of someone climbing out the window and running off into the night. Then it got quiet. All she could hear were Adrian's cries for help. Lauren regained her courage and re-entered the house. She climbed the stairs, and hearing crying from Adrian's room, she headed that way. She never could have been prepared for the horrific scene before her. The entire bedroom floor was covered in blood. 
Leslie was face down in a pool of blood on a pile of clothes with stab wounds all over her upper body and arms. A few feet away, Adrian was crouched down behind her bed, still alive but no longer able to speak and rapidly bleeding to death from multiple stab wounds. There was so much blood in the room that as Lauren went back downstairs, her bare feet slipped. She tried to call 911 from the house phone, but the line had been cut. She grabbed her cell phone and called 911. As she was giving the operator information, that line went dead too. She ran to the car, realizing the intruder could still be nearby. She was terrified the person who had attacked her roommates could do the same thing to her. She called 911 back and drove away. Paramedics quickly arrived on Dorset Street. Leslie was dead. Adrian would die very soon after the paramedics arrived. Both had been stabbed many times. While Lauren could tell police what she heard, she had not seen the attacker and could not provide a description or any information to help find out who had done this. Sorry, you hear my dogs in the background. The police and forensic, forensic investigators painstakingly combed the crime scene for evidence while the girls' families were notified of the horrific events that had taken place that night. Police collected 266 items of potential evidence from crime scene from the crime scene, from microscopic fibers to cigarette butts. The cigarette butts were found outside the home and since neither Lauren, Leslie, nor Adrian smoked, officers believed the attacker had lain in wait, biding his time, smoking cigarettes before entering the home. They also found blood, a single drop of it, outside of the broken kitchen window. It didn't match Leslie or Adrian. It appeared the killer had cut himself. The blood contained the DNA of a white male, a probable North European <laughs> Over the next 11 months, investigators interviewed 1,500 people and collected 200 DNA samples in a desperate attempt to solve the murders, but none were a match. Meanwhile, Rock Lauren racked her brain for clues. She was forced to ask herself painful questions. Was the killer someone she knew? Did he intend to kill her too? She began to suspect everyone, including her friends. Napa was reeling from the savage murders, and because the suspect wasn't caught immediately, residents were terrified and rumors began to swirl. One of the more repeated ones was that Lauren, Leslie, and Adrian were mixed up with drugs and the murders were a hit. Another one... Another one was that Francis Ford Coppola, who owned the winery that Leslie worked at and was therefore Leslie's boss, had mob ties and the ladies were collateral damage. Neither rumor had any basis in either truth or fact. And this picture is a picture of the Coppola winery where she worked. The local police believed that Leslie was the intended victim. She had been attacked first and very viciously. The evidence indicated that she had been sleeping when she was stabbed and had attempted to run away from her killer, headed towards Adrian's room. Adrian, it seems, heard the attack on Leslie and ran to her friend's defense, sustaining fatal stab wounds herself in the process. Police began to check into the backgrounds of Adrian and Leslie looking for a killer. So this is Adrian. Adrian Insagna had cheated death at the age of 16 when she survived a near fatal car crash. The car had rolled three times with Adrian striking her head on the pavement through the open window. 
Always scrappy, she survived and returned to school within a few months, although she did suffer with some memory loss as a result of the temporary brain damage caused by the accident. She would heal and excel in school, earning a scholarship to California Polytechnic State University. She pursued her dream of becoming an engineer successfully. She was hired on by the city of Napa after she graduated. Adrian was working there at the time of her murder. Just four months before her death, she celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the car accident, the time she was granted a miracle and cheated death with one of her closest friends, Lily Prudhomme, who I showed you the picture of them together before. She's the girl that celebrated the housewarming with her. Shortly after being hired by the city, Adrian started dating Christian Lee. Their relationship was rocky, on again, off again. She wanted a serious commitment, and he wasn't ready. Adrian had seen Christian on Halloween night when she dropped by after handing out candy to the kids. She left this place around 10 p.m., and that was the last time he saw her. They had been arguing about her wanting a commitment and about the fact that she had gone to a party recently and met a guy, something that made Christian jealous. Other than the relationship drama with Christian, Adrian led a pretty quiet life. She had a circle of friends, including Lily, that she had known for years. She did not have a high-risk lifestyle. And this is Leslie, former beauty queen. Leslie Mazzara, unlike Adrian, had a huge circle of friends and was extremely outgoing. She was the new girl on the block, having moved to California from Anderson, South Carolina, only a few months earlier. She was a former beauty queen and had considered becoming a teacher or an attorney. Her mother, Kathy, had gone to Berkeley and had invited her daughter out for the summer to work in one of the wineries and gather her thoughts on what career she wanted to pursue. From the moment that Leslie arrived in Napa, she seemed to love it. She went to director Francis Ford Coppola's winery and was hired on the spot. The stunning and outgoing young lady was the perfect fit for the winery. What began as a summer job turned into a passion. She decided that she wanted to make the wine business her career. When her mother relocated to Michigan, Leslie stayed behind in Napa. For Leslie's family, there seemed little cause for concern. She was well-liked, a smart girl, and Napa was a safe, homey community. Leslie was popular, especially with the men. She didn't appear to be a player or a user. In fact, she remained on good terms with everyone she dated. Two of her South Carolina friends who had visited Leslie only weeks before the murders said that she was dating two men at the time. One man was older, and the other they said Leslie was quite serious about. The two friends had been there when the older man came by and spotted flowers the younger man had sent. They claimed the older man was furious. Multiple friends of Leslie said she was a heartbreaker, but an unintentional one. She was a sweet girl who made everyone feel as though he or she was Leslie's best friend. Leslie's computer was searched and an email from an ex was discovered. The two had broken up years earlier after he proposed and she turned him down. But he had reached out to her not long before her murder. The family of another man had sent her on a cruise and she had received a car as a gift from another man. A month before her death, Leslie had returned to South Carolina for a friend's wedding, toting a new set of luggage she received from another admirer. The same friend would report that the night Leslie was murdered, the father of a man Leslie had broken up with had tried repeatedly to reach her by phone. Between Adrian and Leslie, Leslie seemed more likely to have been the target in the eyes of the police. They felt that she may have crossed paths with someone who grew obsessed with her, the murders were clearly not random. The killer had waited outside and then upon gaining entry to the house headed straight upstairs. Police interrogated Christian Lee the day that Adrian was murdered, even getting a DNA sample. They interviewed and obtained samples from the men Leslie had dated. No luck. 
The lack of any suspects or arrest frustrated the victims' families and friends who felt that they had to de- had to defend their reputations and fight to keep the investigation going. Time passed and life moved on for some. Lily Prudholm, Adrian's best friend, decided after Adrian's murder that life was too short and after putting it off the year before, Lily married her boyfriend, Eric Koppel. Adrian's mother, Arlene, attended the wedding where the Maroon 5 song, She Will Be Loved, Adrian's favorite song, was played in her honor. It was a joyous occasion and yet still sad as someone was clearly missing from the Prudhomme Koppel wedding party. In South Carolina, a fundraiser called the Raising Race was organized in Leslie's memory to raise funds for Calvary Home for Children, a charity Leslie worked closely with when she was a beauty queen and living in the area. The Raising Race is a South Carolina version of the Amazing Race and helmed by survivor contestants Rob and Amber, who met Leslie's friend Kelly while competing on the Amazing Race. And the money that they raised from that race went to help pay for this. This is at the Calvary Children's Home. It's a home for abused and neglected children. And this cottage was built in Leslie's honor. So that's a very beautiful tribute to her. As the investigation inched along, police took a closer look at the two cigarette butts found at the scene. They were able to extract DNA from those cigarette butts and it matched the blood found by the kitchen window. In mid-August, police told Lauren that the killer is probably a smoker and she began thinking again. She remembered that Eric Koppel was a smoker. He had been there celebrating the night she and Adrian had moved into the house. And he later married Adrian's friend, Lily. She remembered Koppel as a very shy, very quiet guy, not very social at all. She told homicide detectives about him, and they said they hadn't checked his DNA. A month passed, and she checked with police again. They told Lauren they had not been able to reach him. Police were still focused on the cigarettes, and the next day they decided to publicly release the evidence about the cigarette butts and released photos of the brand smoked by the killer. They were camel Turkish gold and had only been on the market for four months at the time of the murders. The police believed revealing the brand of cigarettes would result in someone knowing who the killer was. They had no idea the killer would contact them himself. It was a Tuesday night. All of the detectives working the case had left for the day. Eric Koppel showed up at the station with his wife, Lily, and other family members. This guy. Remember, he married Adrian's friend. Like other Napa residents, they had heard about the Turkish gold cigarettes being found at the crime scene. Family and friends of Koppel recognized he smoked that brand. Within days, Koppel, after consulting with family and believing he was about to be caught, turned himself in, confessing to killing Adrian and Leslie. The news of Eric Koppel's arrest was a mixture of relief and devastation. Adrian's mother, Arlene, was shocked and horrified that the husband of Adrian's best friend, whose wedding she had attended in January in place of Adrian, where she was invited to read from the Bible in memory of her slain daughter, had murdered her daughter. Koppel had even attended a candlelight vigil organized by Adrian's friends two weeks after the murder. Adrian's mother said she never felt he was dangerous. She never felt any kind of a negative, dangerous, sinister vibe from him at all. Allegedly, Koppel wrote a suicide note, that indicated he was jealous of Adrian's close friendship with Lily. Adrian had become close friends with Lily while working together for the city of Napa. Both Lily and her then fiance Eric Koppel, had visited the house and he had met Adrian numerous times 
but he had never met Leslie. For Leslie's family, there was a sense of relief that she was not the sole target, but equal confusion because he didn't know Leslie, a fact that did not appear to deter him on the night that he took her life. The police came under scrutiny with Koppel's arrest. They had never interviewed him, nor taken a DNA sample, despite him being in Adrian's inner circle and having been to the Dorset Street home. Koppel also remained at large for a month after Lauren gave his name to police. They had apparently called him and left messages, which Koppel did not respond to, but police never followed up. After the arrest, the police chief said they would have eventually spoken to Koppel and obtained a DNA sample. Koppel provided a DNA sample after his arrest, and to no surprise, his DNA matched that found on the cigarettes and the blood found at the scene. Eric Koppel was 26 years old with no prior criminal record when he broke into his fiance's best friend's house in the middle of the night and attacked and murdered Adrian and Leslie. He had a lifelong history of depression and suicidal thoughts. He often used alcohol to try to deal with his moods. No motive was ever officially put forward for these murders, with Koppel himself being unable to explain what drove him to carry them out. However, it is believed that his jealousy over the close friendship that he that had developed between Adrian and his fiance, Lily, is all it took to make him snap. They worked together and often socialized together. Koppel saw this as a threat to his relationship, so he put an end to it on Halloween night. Eric Koppel was charged with double murder and pleaded guilty to both charges. After discussions with the victim's families, Koppel's attorneys, and the DA's office, an agreement was reached which took the death penalty off the table. In January of 2007, Eric Koppel was sentenced to life in prison with no opportunity for parole. He also waived his right to appeal. The mothers of both Adrian and Leslie addressed Koppel and the court. Picture here. This is Arlene, Adrian's mom. Arlene recounted that her daughter never wore turtlenecks in life, but was buried in one to attempt to cover the wounds Koppel had left on her. She counted out the number of stab wounds he had delivered to Adrian's body. This is Leslie's mom, Kathy. Leslie's mother, Kathy Harrington, looked directly at Koppel while reading from a 13-page letter, which said in part, For the rest of your life, you and your family will experience what both your victims and loved ones have felt. Terror. Desperation. Hopelessness. Violence. I wish I could tell you that I forgave you. At this time, I cannot. And finally... I pray that you, that never again will any mother's child grow up to be a murderer. Koppel did not look at either Arlene or Kathy as they made their statements. Koppel's wife, Lily, also spoke at the trial. Here she is. She admitted to grieving with Adrian's mother, but said that she knew a gentler Eric than the Eric that murdered her friend. She publicly proclaimed her support for her husband, telling the court, in the days before he confessed, I knew something was terribly bothering him. I told him, Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. Those words are just as true today as they were that afternoon. Before he was sentenced, Koppel himself spoke. He apologized to the Insagna and Mazzara families. He even cried. He blamed the murders on the death of his grandfather, which sent him into a depression, along with alcohol he was using in an attempt to cope with the depression. He said that he was going to kill himself, but decided instead to turn himself in so there would be closure to the case. Lily herself said, 
that Eric killed because of his depression. Despite her claim that he could do nothing to change her love for him, she did later divorce him, but kept his name. So why did Eric Koppel kill? Was it depression? Was it alcohol? It's no coincidence that November 1st, 2004, the day of the murders, was the date that he and Lily had initially planned to get married. Remember, she had put it off. She had backed out. Lily later said that she and Adrian would discuss their relationships with each other, as friends do. It's possible that Lily may have decided to call off the wedding after one of those discussions. Maybe she told Eric. Maybe not. But Eric's decision to murder Lily's friend was one of extreme passive aggressiveness. He couldn't kill Lily. He didn't want to kill Lily. So he could do the next best thing and punish Lily by killing her best friend. He had been to the house before. He likely knew that Adrian slept upstairs. He probably didn't know that Lauren slept downstairs, which spared her life. He had never met Leslie, and he may not have known there were three women in the home that night. And now, let's put up Lauren. This is the only survivor from that night. When Lauren was asked why she thought Koppel didn't kill her, she said, I don't know. I just happened to have my door closed that night. That's it. That's the only thing. Lauren remains tortured by questions. What if she had opened that door and let her dog out? What if she had confronted the intruder when she heard him enter the house? Would she also be dead? Lauren has since relocated to L.A. She says she actually feels safer in a larger city where crime is the norm. She says she still has fear, but she's coping with it with the help of good friends and exercising. So the only moral I could come up with for this story is keep your friends close, but keep an eye on their significant others. I hope you guys enjoyed my Halloween story and that you've got some spooky, scary plans in store for the upcoming day. As always, I will see you all in the next one.